he's an, an amazing statistician, uh, gatherer of information, engineer. He has a brilliant mind, and you don't want to be against him if, if he's <laughs> testifying against you, because he will give the facts. He doesn't give emotion, although he's an, a very, very emotional man. He loves horses. He just adores them. But when he is testifying, when he is presenting a study, he's all facts, he's all information, and he's indisputable. Um, I said that the GAO report, which he had written a study to show that it was a total fraud, and that was the vehicle by which the defunding language that had been in place was removed. And he was able to prove that it was a total fraud. I'm so pleased to have him here, John Holland. I feel like, I feel like I'm with, with my family here. You know, you, you people, we've, we've, many of us have known each other for many, many years. Now, I'm an engineer. That means I'm going to have problems learning to use this. It's, it's got two buttons, and I'll definitely press the wrong one. But, uh, you know, uh, Victoria was mentioning what, how engineers think, and she and I are both engineers, and, uh, and I know Stu over here is an engineer, and we, we probably have several others in the room, but most of you don't know uh, uh, how we think. So I'll say just a, a word or two. Uh, Dilbert, uh, if, for those of you who like the Dilbert cartoon strip about the engineer, they had a, uh, a cartoon years ago that explained it all. Um, Dilbert's mother was sitting at the doctor's office with little baby Dilbert, and uh, the doctor tapped his right knee and his left knee moved. And uh, so uh, the doctor said, hmm, said, does he uh, uh, tear things apart? She says, yes, yeah, he tears everything apart. He says, uh, that's, uh, doctor, well, that's, that's pretty normal. That's, that's pretty normal. Does he do anything with the parts? And she said, yes, he builds ham radio sets. <laughs> and the doctor said, oh, God. She said, I'm afraid that clinches my findings. She said, uh, I'm afraid uh, that he's got what we call the knack. And uh, she said, well, well, what's the knack? He said, he, he has to know how everything works. And uh, so... She said, well, is there any cure for it? And the doctor said, no, I'm afraid he'll be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> we have to know how things work. So thank heavens for the, the lady over here. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name that, that brought up the question uh, about what are we going to do with all these horses. It's the big question. And I will begin to answer it. It won't be a really easy answer. Uh, but first we have to understand where we're coming from. So, like I said, if this would, will work, or maybe, oh, no, nope. is, uh, is there a switch? I told you I could mess this up. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you have to turn it on. I see, I told you, I'm an engineer. Okay, uh, I've done worse, believe me. Uh, and, and uh, Vicki will tell you uh, about that. Uh, by the way, we have the EWA board here almost in total. Uh, uh, Vicki and Jeff and his lovely wife, uh, uh, Virginia and uh, Daryl. And uh, so I want to appreciate, I really appreciate them coming. Uh, I had to have somebody that would clap. Uh, so to understand the, the, pa uh, the, the present and the future, we have to understand the past. And this is this graph you've all seen a thousand times, those of you who have been in this, we keep this updated every year. This is the latest version of it. And it shows the number of horses going to slaughter. Uh, the red is horses slaughtered in the U.S., which, thank God, dropped to zero after 2007. Uh, the green is Mexico, and uh, the blue is Canada, and, and on the top is a purple for Japan. We send some live horses over to Japan. And as you can see, you know, we've always exported horses to both Canada and to a certain uh, extent to Mexico. Uh, in 2007, uh, well, well, a few things happened. Let me start by saying, why did we spike up here? Well, there were tax changes in the 80s. In the best we can tell, a huge number of horses found themselves no longer wanted because uh, you were able to invest in a horse farm if you were very wealthy 
and then take the losses, you know, which would be everything, because <laughs> we all know how, to, as, they, as they say, you know, to make a small fortune in horses, you have to start with a large one. Uh, and so you used to be able to do that and then just write off all your losses against your automotive business or whatever other business you were in. You couldn't do that anymore. And especially the Arabs, the Arabs were, were the, uh, the big breed back then, and it sort of collapsed. A lot of them went to slaughter. It peaked in 89 and 90, and then it kept on going on a downhill until, uh, really interestingly, it was starting to go up in 2001, and, and it bounced back down. That was the day Cavell burned. Uh, and it, they had, if it had not burned, they would it would have been going up on a ramp that you'll see a little bit. Cavell stayed out of operations for two years. Uh, it reopened, and horse slaughter kept going up. Now, in 2007, the plants closed. You would have expected a big drop then, but the plants knew it was coming. They were, they were under assault in a million ways. So that we had state laws against it, and, and, and uh, Kaufman had ordered them closed down there. So we knew that they, they were not caught flat-footed. They simply told the trucks, you know, head north and head south. But there's another little interesting uh, inflection point here. Uh, the EU scandal. Notice that the, that the number of horses sent, uh, went down last year. And it started going down exactly when the EU scandal broke. Uh, the, the meat had been being used. We were trying to figure out how they were eating this much horse meat. Uh, we, could, you know, we kept reading articles about how horse meat was no longer as popular as it had been, and yet the consumption, of the imports were going up and up. Uh, well, if anybody was surprised at that, uh, you know, you shouldn't have been because um, everything in this industry, top to bottom, left to right, is crooked. Mm -hmm. They don't, that's why they don't have to obey regulations. Other people have to obey. How they got this amnesty against uh, regulation, we'll never know. But uh, certainly, you know, we would expect them to mix. In fact, they had mixed horse meat um, in America in, in the uh, early 90s. They got caught with uh, big 50-gallon drums of, of hamburger meat that had a, uh, a layer of good hamburger meat on top and the rest of it was horse meat. Now, just most recently, just a couple of weeks ago, they caught a German company uh, that was mixing horse meat with rotted beef uh, to make it look red, more red, because horse meat is a darker red. These are good, good people. This is, this is good agriculture. Another little interesting uh, graph, here is the exports to uh, Canada and Mexico. We never have understood why uh, Mexico spiked in 1994, but basically they kind of drifted along and, and Mexico was going up until 2007 when they both got a huge spike from the fact that we closed our slaughter plants. Now there's another little inflection point here. Do you notice that Canada and Mexico cross? Guess what that coincides with? Mexico starts testing for phenylbutazone. I mean, Canada starts testing for phenylbutazone. And, it, and you saw it seeing articles, horses found with phenylbutazone in Canada. And all of a sudden, all the thoroughbreds started heading south. You won't find a thoroughbred going north because as, as ineffectual as the tests are, they only test, uh, you know, a, a 3% of the horses. As ineffectual as they are, the, the, the kill buyer still didn't want the bad rep, so why not send them to Mexico? Mexico is a has got an approved program for the EU that does not test for phenylbutazone. It just, it doesn't even require you on your EID to say that the horse hadn't been given butyl. It's exempt. Figure that one out. You know, when, when, when the EU bans the drug in ever being given to an animal that goes to food. So, the big question is what will be the consequences of, of an end to, uh, I'm sorry, I said horse slaughter, I really meant the humane harvesting of unwanted horses <laughs> so that you could get a residual value and, and recover your assets. <laughs> I, I, I have to learn to speak the new speak. <laughs> we used to have a slide of, a, of horse, uh, horse harvesting which uh, showed a, a harvesting machine chasing a bunch of Mustangs. <laughs> so what does a historical record show us? Well, if, if you've been working and, and, and you pride your town on having a crime rate of a much larger city and your plant leaves, you're going to lose a lot of that uh, uh, source of pride. Uh, you're, 
your crime rate's going to plunge. Uh, this is what happened in Kaufman, uh, and, it, and there's no doubt that that was what caused it, because we looked at the communities surrounding, and their crime rates didn't take this dive. Uh, it was definitely caused by the gentleman that worked in this plant leaving. That tells you something about what happens if you lose your plant. You also lose a little pollution and a few other things, right, Paul? Just minor things. It, you, no more blood in the streets, no more excitement, no more blood coming up in the bathtubs and that kind of thing. There's another thing you lose. You, you lose your community of horse thieves. You know, it's devastating to them. Uh, it's, and <laughs> you can see when Slaughter passed uh, uh, Proposition 6 in 2008, uh, it plunged down, it popped up just a little bit, and then it kept on plunging down. And now I, I suspect that if I updated this for the last few years, it would probably be coming back up. Why? Because the kill buyers have pretty much figured out that, that nobody's enforcing it in California. And so, you know, but it's, it's a very interesting uh, thing that, uh, that will affect. But what about equine welfare? That's the big question. Will equine welfare suffer? We are told endlessly and over and over that equine welfare will, will suffer horses to be abandoned, abused, and neglected. In, in 2011, the GAO published that study, which has been mentioned several times. It, it was quite amazing because I talked to Terry Horner, who was the, was the researcher for it, and I began to suspect that something wasn't right. Um, he didn't like statistics. He, saw, he said my statistics were biased and, uh, and partisan. And I thought, that's a funny thing to say about num numbers that come from a government website, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, I suspected it was going to be bad, uh, and, and it did turn out, uh, but he delayed it. It was supposed to come out uh, that December, and then in January, he, he proudly announced to the, uh, the other summit of the horse, the Dark Side Summit, uh, which I know some people call the scummit of the horse. Uh, I wouldn't do that because I'm a gentleman, but uh, he announced that it was going to be favorable to them. Uh, that was uh, Sue, the late Sue Wallace's slaughter summit. And indeed, it did, it did, it did turn out uh, to be, but they delayed it until just before uh, the vote uh, so that it couldn't be discredited before they voted on the inspections language. And they, they brought it out in, in June. We all looked at it and scratched our heads because I had told him, you can't possibly blame anything on this because look at, you saw that first chart, slaughter didn't go down. If slaughter didn't go down, it doesn't matter where you slaughtered them you know, or what color the building was they slaughtered him. If the number slaughtered was the same, then you can't blame anything on that as a statistician. And we all knew that, but they went ahead and they said, oh, but they had longer trips to the slaughterhouse, so the kill buyers weren't willing to pay as much because they had to, to pay more for gas. Well, the argument to that, of course, is, you know, if you're in a slaughter auction, when did you ever raise your hand and say, I, I bid $50 less because i got to pay a long uh, trip of gas. I, I can't pay that much. It doesn't work that way. The guy that... that, that wins the auction is a guy that, uh, that makes the most money and, and can make the most money and, and can afford to do it. Uh, so we knew it was wrong, but that's different than being able to find a smoking gun. It just didn't make any sense. Anyhow, the horse market did in fact pretty much crash after 2007, and especially the low end of the horse market. Uh, anybody that watches, as I do, uh, for Horses on Craigslist, you started seeing free horse, free horse, free to good home, you know. Uh, it, it, and you saw whole herds, especially of quarter horses, uh, you know, we're getting rid of our breeding stock. And, you, and they, would, they would have 25 mares on, on, on an ad. So what caused that? Well, we decided that if, if they had their study with the GAO, which is, is a very prestigious organization and had a good reputation, we would have to have our study, and I started researching and realized there was some real information that we, we could provide, and, and it got more and more interesting. It's like solving a puzzle. And uh, so I went to the Kentucky Journal of uh, Equine Agriculture and Natural Resources Law, and they had had a pro-slaughter uh, article on their blog by somebody who said how necessary, it, how bad it had been that the plants closed. And I said, you know, we're finding some data that you ought to look at because I'd like you to peer review it. If we're wrong, you know, have your reviewers tell us where we're wrong. This is as close as we can come to, to a GAO report, is to be in a peer-reviewed law journal. And it's not online, but uh, we do have printed versions of it in the back, and you're welcome to pick one up. That's, that's it right there. I'm trying to get them to put it online. They usually, they like to sell their, 
the publication, so they don't like to put it online for a year or two. Uh, Laura Allen helped me with this, and the first half of this has got a really good explanation of all the legal battles. We think it's inspections, inspections came, inspections went, and that's it. There was legal battles, and there were legal battles, you know. And it just like with De Los Santos, how many legal battles circled around that. And he eventually understood that whether we intended it or not, the legal battles were largely a delaying action for what Victoria finally did. And they, and they didn't figure it out till too late, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that report, I, on the, the very first summit, I had just discovered this data. And I was fascinated by it, and I presented it at that first summit and said, look at that. We are producing less and less and less hay and alfalfa each year. And we're exporting a good deal of the alfalfa we do produce. So what's happening? We are, we're dropping to a level where our own farmers, and that's dairy as well as, as, as horse people, can't get enough hay if anything goes wrong. The margin is zero thin. And what goes wrong? A drought. Why can't they get enough hay? Well, this chart might give you an idea. We're making a little more ethanol. We told all these people with our wonderful government policy that we were going to be energy independent of the Mideast. We didn't know about natural gas fracking back then. And the best way seemed to draw, be to, to grow some corn and uh, to distill it. And it had uh, is many bad side effects. It's hard on the engines. It's hard on, if any of you have small en engines, you know, weed trimmers and things like that, you, you probably noticed that your fuel lines rot off now. <laughs> At least they did on the generations before. But they forced them to put it in the gas, and they gave them a subsidy for it. Well, it, it limped along. It was 30 years the subsidy was in until about 2006, and suddenly the gas with ethanol, ethanol became cheaper than the gasoline. What does that do? That makes the, the, the ethanol take off and the production take off, and that makes farmers say, I'm growing corn, and we don't have any, in, as many hay fields. So what happened to the price? The price skyrocketed, and now, however, you notice there's another spike on top of it on price in 2008. Why did that spike occur when the general trend was gently upward? The reason is, that year we had drought in the whole southeast, and we had some in the northwest. I was personally buying hay the first time I've ever done it from as far, three and four states away. I had to build a hay barn just so that I could store a truckload and bring in a truckload at a time. It was a terrible year uh, in the south. And I remember it because the inside of my hay barn I built all the plywood uh, has a date stamped on it says 2007. <laughs> and I had forgotten about the drought, you know, when I, when I found this data. And then I looked, I was, I was getting some hay one day and I said, wait a minute, that's the year. And I looked back at the, at the drought statistics. That's what drove the prices up. It, that thin, that margin that we had of available hay went away. And of course, you had other prices that went up. And so this, this study is national. So we had a spike in gasoline prices. Well, oh, great. You know, what else can go wrong? You know, we've got drought. And then we had a spike in unemployment. And we had, you know, the fiscal meltdown. Other than that, it was a great year. <laughs> so look at the stress factors. These are percent of what they were in 2000. These are stress factors on things that are important to horse owners. Gasoline had a 120% uh, increase. Unemployment had gone up uh, drastically. So 2008, all of these are kind of uh, crossing at very high levels. No wonder people couldn't afford their horses. No wonder you would expect to see some problems in 2008. In a minute, you'll see them. And this had nothing, nothing to do with whether we slaughtered them in Mexico or Canada. And the GAO missed this completely. But that didn't tell me which factors were most important. We needed to know what is really, really going on here. Was it the hay, you know, or was it the gasoline, or was it the unemployment? Most people tended to think it was the unemployment. So I, uh, we ran yet another study and causes and effect in, in history. To do this, uh, I had to call every state of the union to their agriculture departments and try to find out who kept statistics on abuse and neglect. It's a long process. And you don't just make one phone call. Then they tell you to see so-and-so, and she's on vacation, and then they see so-and-so, and they promise you something, and they don't send it. So eventually, though, 
um, we were able to, to compare these causative factors on a state-by-state -state basis. We got data from six states. And this is that data. Now the top red line is the total slaughter. So you get an idea of how many horses we were slaughtering during that period. And the different uh, colored lines are the various states, Colorado, Illinois, Idaho, Georgia, Maine. Notice something that you should find very interesting. They all spiked in 2008. This was taken by pro slaughter forces as being absolute proof that the closing of the plants had, had <laughs> caused a disaster. <clears throat> you know, and they did, and they had reason to believe in their small world, they're standing there and they see a lot of abuse and neglect, and they tell you, you don't understand, Mr. Holland, we had a lot of abuse and neglect the very year after the slaughter plants closed. Now, look at the price per, per ton of hay in each of those states. <laughs> Do you notice anything about 2008? <laughs> it's just obvious. It just jumps out at you. But having said that, uh, being an engineer, I had to know whether it would really prove out to be true. So I did something called uh, a Pearson coefficient uh, uh, on all this data. I know you all are very excited about this. Horse people love Pearson coefficients. So <laughs> there it is. Now, don't laugh if you, if, you, if, you, if when you have your lunch, the dessert people are going to require you to recite this <laughs> before you get your dessert. This will t now, what does a Pearson coefficient tell you about things? You've got two numbers, x and y. We all know from geometry that a straight line, if you know x, you know y on a straight line. It's just, you know, x equals 2y or plus 1 or whatever. Uh, but the Pearson coefficient tells you if two groups of numbers that are not quite so clear are related to each other. If you get a, a plus one, it, it runs from minus one to plus one. If you get a plus one, it's a perfect positive relationship. If I've got two sets of numbers with a, a plus one, then it's a straight line, and I know that A equals something times B, uh, and, and, and I know exactly what's that A causes B or B causes A, or they're both caused by something else. Uh, if it's a minus, it's a negative relationship. Now, why is this important? Well, they keep telling us that slaughter prevents abuse and neglect, right? They, we all know slaughter prevents abuse and neglect. These horses would be abandoned. And, so we should get a big negative person when we check slaughter, the number of horses slaughtered against abuse and neglect. It should show that more, more slaughter helps abuse and neglect. Zero in numbers that, are, that close in on zero means these two things don't have anything to do with each other. They're all over the place. Now, granted, you, you know, the more data you have, the better this works. It, it usually works pretty good to pick out the main causative factor. But to pack, pick out smaller contributors, uh, then you need more data points because the, the, it's sort of like trying to look at a, uh, it's something into the sun. The, the, the big factor is blinding you, and the, and the smaller factors uh, don't come out until you get a lot of data points. But we did the... Uh, the coefficients, and what's really interesting, if you if you look at the uh, at unemployment, these are positive numbers except for uh, except for Maine, uh, and it's a very small negative number. And Georgia, I'm sorry, Georgia really only had five data points. So what this is telling you is it's it's not predictable, very predictable because they're going all over the place, and it means something else is overwhelming that number. And that something is hay, positive across the board. And a 0.889 is nearly a straight line. So what you're finding is that if you know the price of hay in an area, you know the amount of abuse and neglect. And this goes beyond people that have to buy hay. It goes to grazing because grass isn't growing. So the horses that are out on that nice big pasture don't get grass. Um, if you look over here at slaughter, those are supposed to be negative numbers. We were told slaughter helps. That, that if you get more slaughter, you get less abuse and neglect. They're positive numbers. It was all a lie. It doesn't, can't be proven. Now, having said that, I can't tell you for sure that slaughter causes abuse and neglect or abuse and neglect causes slaughter or, or what. But here's what I, I, I suspect. I suspect to a certain extent 
slaughter does cause abuse and neglect because we know that the trucks turn over, that, that people get caught with pens full of animals, that they don't respect their animals. So they, that is a problem. But I suspect also that the price of hay dr drives some people to sell their horses. And when they go, when the market's down and nobody wants to buy a horse, who gets it? Slaughter. By the way, we all also found that abandonment followed the same exact curves. And uh, New Mexico is the only state that keeps the statistics. And the, the bad news was more people abandoned horses, and it was true. I didn't believe that, but they did abandon more. Uh, the, the good news is it was only 40 people. <laughs> so the, the massive abandonment didn't happen. It was just a very small trend, but there was a trend there. But here's the, the key uh, line in the GAO report. It starts off saying comprehensive national data are lacking, but state, local, government organizations report a rise. They did this throughout the report. People tell us, the, the officials tell us, the government tells us, they never said who in government told them and how we could ever check the fact. It was just people tell us. But they felt like they had to throw in one statistic. So in the second paragraph, the second sentence, they said, for example, Colorado data showed investigations for horse neglect and abuse increased more than 60% from uh, 975 in 2005 to 1588 in 2009. This got picked up by the press. The closing of the plant caused 60% increase in abuse and neglect. And it was printed all over the place. Our good friend Jerry Clousing, which uh, <laughs> Vickery's had wonderful conversations with, uh, <laughs> printed this statistic. Well, first of all, that is not exactly what it says because it turns out there's a little problem here and none of us saw it in the original report. 2007? You know, the first sentence says abandoned horses since 2007, and the second one says, for example, since 2005. What? Shouldn't it be since 2007? <laughs> well, it turns out they had a reason for doing that. They did have accurate numbers. They just used the wrong dates. And 2009, they had data through 2010. Here it look, is what it looks like on a graph. They had the, the plants closing here. Uh, does this have a laser on it? I don't know. Oh, well, I won't try. I won't, I won't tempt the fates. Uh, but the, if they had taken the data from here to the end of the data they had, it would have been a decrease. And that's not what the guy had been told to find. So he took the data from two years before they closed, and then he kind of he didn't want to take this because that's still not a very good increase. And he didn't want to take this because it was too obvious that he was going back in, day, in years. So he, he took it to 2009 and showed a 60% increase, which was total garbage. So there was, he didn't mention at all that abuse and neglect was going down. Now, if, you had looked, if they had looked at hay prices, and, and graph them next to abuse and neglect, you would have seen. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. If, you, if they had taken hay prices versus abuse and neglect, you know, you can see they, they correlate very nicely. But if you had to look just a couple of years later, and you know, now we, we've seen even more data, look at those two curves. Look at them. The GAO missed that. They didn't even have the word hay in their whole report. The word hay was not in the 60 pages about equines. And it's, it's kind of overwhelming and staggering. Of course, people say to me, you mean you spent uh, three years studying this to find out horses eat hay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> when hay stocks are declining, as I said before, we're, we are in trouble because their hay stocks are, uh, uh, hay production is declining due to land use changes, and then we have a, uh, a bad uh, drought and it goes over the top. So the question is, how do you, do you file this report? Uh, I decided that this is where I would file it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want uh, data, there's a lot more wrong in that report. This is just the, the smoking gun. Go to uh, YouTube, and hopefully we'll, you'll have better luck than we had <laughs> earlier, but, and, and just type in in the search window how the GAO deceived Congress.
I went to the GAO about this. Victoria got me lined up with her representative to talk to them. And what did they say the whole time, Victoria? They, they, they assured us that their, their technique of uh, editing their reports and double checking them was flawless. No, they yeah, yeah. assured us their method. Their method was flawless. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, their method was flawless. They would never speak to what we found at all, not one word. And I went to the GAO IG. Uh, I did a FOIA. They denied my FOIA. The GAO IG ignored me. But, you know, we put out this video and, and uh, pass it around. <laughs> now, that all brings me up to the, to the real thing. How are we going to live without slaughter? I'm, I mean, I can't help your crime rate. It's going to be down, you know. <laughs> You're stuck with that. Uh, but to, in order to understand this problem, look at, uh, I, I, I use little life charts. And here's a foal has been born and the breeder, let's say, takes care of him, does some training, maybe the breeder and a trainer, for the first year of his life. That hay bale represents one year of supporting this horse. Vet bills, everything. And then, if he's lucky, and it doesn't get sold as a yearling, as your horses did, we have a sport owner that steps in. And he keeps it for two, three years, long enough to, you know, pretty well use it up in a lot of sports or, you know, find out whether it has any real ability. And after it's two or three years, who's going to feed it the rest of its life? Now, as you said, the original idea a lot of people have is when they're done racing, we'll send them to a sanctuary. But if you look at it not in terms of horses, but in terms of horse years, You've got to multiply. Now, I only showed this horse living 25 years. Really, 30 would be a better guess. But, you know, you've got uh, 21 years of support for that sanctuary before you can take in another horse. In other words, that slot in the sanctuary is tight. We can't have, you can't do, you can't get out of it with sanctuaries. You just can't do it. It's, it's mathematically impossible, as, as, as you pointed out. So let's look at where those horses could go. We had different sectors, and this is a Deloitte study in 2005. It's probably roughly the same. Um, there's a lot less breeding right now, but the horse population hasn't really dropped all that much. Uh, around 9 million uh, is slowly dropping. Uh, but if you look at racing, and uh, that's the blue sliver, you say, oh, well, those horses will easily fit into the recreational sector. <laughs> Who in all of this keeps their horses for life? The recreational people. This is the guy that we're always told has got to send his horse to slaughter because it's old and decrepit and he won't take care of it. We're always, he's always gets a bad rep because he's not a businessman. He just loves his horse and has it in the barn in the back. He's not the one that sends the horses to slaughter. The sport owner is the one that sends them to slaughter. And we all know that now. The old horse myth is just, is just nonsense. But uh, if you want to get them into the recreational sector now, remember the recreational sector is fairly large. But it keeps these horses for maybe 15 or 20 years. So the input through the recreational sector is not as big as this appears. You want to buy the horse time at each level. So what you would like to do is extend the sport career, first of all. That takes one more year, maybe two more years of support for the horse where he's still at the racetrack or he's still at the rodeo or whatever he does for a living. And you can take that horse and then you can... Uh, you can do that in a number of ways. We're going to look at ways that we can extend its racing career. Now we only, we're down to 20 years. Let's say uh, we, we get that horse into a second career, jumping or show horses. And here, this point has already been brought up. We need to encourage these people not to breed new horses for these industry, but take these wonderful thoroughbreds and, and these uh, uh, saddlebreds and, and uh, uh, standard breads and, and even the quarter horses, you know, and, and try to use them again to give them new careers. We don't need to be breeding horses for these things when we have the supply of them. Uh, and then let's say uh, the horse ends that career, we get him into a recreational ownership. In this case, the recreational owner keeps him for five years. Usually they, they'll keep him for life if they can. Most people will. He gets him for five years and he, he can't uh, he hits a bad year for, for money, or hay, you know. And so it goes to a rescue. Now, this is the old model, which we've done a lot. And the rescue rehabs it and, and maybe does a little training and advertises it and puts it out. And it goes out to a rehome, a new home. Uh, we've used up two homes here. And really, this is not the most efficient way to do it. 
So let's go back to a recreational owner and then consider that we do a rescue in place. What's a rescue in place? You know, we find out that these horses aren't being taken proper care of or the person comes to us. This is this has got to be an industry buy-in. I mean, I make it sound simple, but we've got to have a buy-in by the entire horse industry. And they go, we go, somebody goes out of representatives and says, yeah, you want some help with your horses because hay prices are so high. We want to see your facilities, we want to see your horses, we want to see what you're doing, and we will help you with hay and, and feed. We'll give you credits at the grain store. We will not give you money, because that will immediately start the scammers in there. And uh, then we'll check on your horses periodically, and if you can't get them you know, out of this situation in a year or two, we're going to have to cut it off, because this is temporary help. Now, you're, you're, you're a recreational owner who, in very many cases, was heartbroken that he was going to lose his horse. Now he can keep his horse. We've still got that other home, and now we got two horses placed. And then, of course, uh, you know, things do go wrong where nobody wants one. Uh, it's lame. It's crippled. It's blind. i got a, a field full of them. Uh, there are a lot of, of such horses here that, that would really be hard to, to, to place. That's where you... you you get into equine sanctuaries and euthanasia. We got to make euthanasia available, whether we like it or not. It's got to be part of the solution. It's got to be the last, the last straw. Okay, what actions do we need? First, land use reform. We're lucky they already repealed the uh, uh, the um, subsidy on on ethanol. We need to discourage breeding. Uh, that ethanol subsidy was what was driving the production of, of corn. Uh, so we should be seeing some relief in land. I'm going to do some new graphs uh, uh, to see how that's looking, you know, whether we've actually had some relief in uh, land use. We need to discourage breeding, and, and we need to extend primary careers. We need to support secondary careers, and we need to encourage recreational ownership. The recreational owners are the people that are going to save us here. This is the only place you can put these horses. And y you've got to support them as well as encourage them. So let me go into just a few more details, and I'll let you go to lunch. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. El eliminate tax incentives. Yeah. What, it, what could be stupider than to incentivize something, a behavior we don't want? That's got to be the that's got to be the dumbest thing in the world. Of course, it makes sense for the people getting the incentives. Place a surcharge on registrations. You know, you're making the money off these horses. They need to, they need, you need to pay some of that to their horse's future. Assess, assess gate and event fees uh, to go to rescues and retraining facilities. Now, how do we extend the primary career of the horse? We, first of all, eliminate all performance enhancing drugs and race day drugs and event day drugs. The, the horses, everybody who's rescued a horse here, like a thoroughbred, knows they come in as drug addicts. It takes six months to get them off, the, to get them back into a stable uh, diet and, and, and learning that they don't need uh, all those drugs. Start careers after three. That way we gain a year right away. We've forced the, the people that started all this to pay for one more year of the, of the upkeep. Reduce hazards such as... Uh, shoeing, um, pads on walking horses. Uh, can you ever see those things? They look like they got suitcases bolted to their feet. Uh, I would, I will give uh, kudos to the Humane Society. They've been really working hard to eliminate that Keith Dane. Uh, stacks and toe clips, which can, can cause breakdowns on, on certain track surfaces. And you can also look at improving the venues. That could be uh, doing studies on the, on the track surfaces and doing studies on the jumps so that fewer horses get injured, whatever they are and eliminate abusive training practices. Yeah. Yeah. All of this will extend their career. So all of these bad behaviors are shortening the careers and causing more slaughter. And tighten pre-event inspections. Okay, support secondary careers. First of all, we need to support our horse shows. They're important and they give a horses jobs. And, and you know, uh, we need to support all for forms of equine therapy. They help both horses and kids and, and veterans and uh, shell shock victims. That's something we really need to do. It's not a lot of horses, but it's, it's important. Uh, we have to incentivize the retraining of racehorses. So as somebody already mentioned,
class of just thoroughbreds or class of just you can't get in this class with a horse that was bred to rescue, uh, yeah, rescue. It has to be a rescue horse exactly a, re, a, a rehomed horse yep and and you can also by the way encourage older horses and that'll keep them event give have some classes of events that you that the horse has to be 10 years old you know and it gives them it gives them a, a, a way to keep them in the show a little longer well, we want to suck people into taking care of the horses longer. That's what the whole thing is. <laughs> encourage handicap events such as uh, older horses in your class. Um, encourage recreational owners. Now, this is encourage. This isn't support, okay? Support things like riding trails. You know, take the time to go down when, they're, when the railroad track right away is being given away and they're going to give it to, uh, you know, joggers or something. Go down and, and, and ask for that the horses be allowed to use it. Because then houses along that right of way will all, all of a sudden have a place to ride. They may only have two acres, but they have a place to ride. Uh, support horse friendly zoning. Support recreational horse events. All of them, you know. Uh, I, I, uh, I used to do a little bit of uh, endurance riding. It was great fun. It was exciting until I, I won one time and it turned out I had missed a sign. <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm at the back. How, how is everybody clapping for me? <laughs> I missed one sign, caught the next sign. <laughs> and support recreational owners. Uh, this is very important. We've got to find the way. There have been horse uh, hay banks. There have been some really good efforts. Uh, but if the hay bank is in the wrong place, and, and the hay can end up you know, getting old and nobody wants it anymore, it's a, it's a very uh, tough thing. And we're looking at this in, in EWA. We would, we would really thank anybody that wanted to help us with it. But we're going to have to have a way of getting the hay where it's needed. And we can predict ahead. The great thing is we know, you know from the weather forecast pretty much where this problem is going to occur. And so we can start to move assets in that direction. I think uh, rail transport, you know, whole rail cars, Full of hay was a good way to do it. Uh, one uh, one lady a couple of years ago uh, did a, a very noble job of trying to get hay into a drought area, only to have the truckers take her up front money and run, wow. and and it left the horses with no hay and and her with a bad reputation and it was disgusting. We are going to have to be tough business people. We don't let that crap happen. You know, it's, you're not going to pull that stuff on us. You know. Implement uh, rescue in place programs, as I said before. Support rescues and training, uh, retraining facilities, and of course, uh, retirement facilities, sanctuaries, and make Gelden clinics available. Now, you know, I, I think that's a no-brainer. And if the uh, AVMA wants to really do anything about the evils of horse slaughter, they can certainly suggest their members do that. And uh, you know, make euthanasia available. And I, I personally think that, that you, can, you can take some of that tax money you're giving for breeding and give it to, to veterinarians and to uh, people who, who supply these services and maybe we can make some progress. So basically, if you want any of this, more of any of this information, just go to our website, it's all free and all the studies are there. Uh, that's uh, my solution to the world's problems. <laughs>